Well, welcome, Congressman. I, I guess I can't call you chairman officially for another month, but I think it's fascinating that even before Democrats took back the House, around Washington, the word was, well, hey, infrastructure, that's one thing we can all agree on. We can move forward on. The president wants it. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened. Well, now, how will things be different than in 2019? Well, can you move a package? Well, Bipartisan? Unfortunately, uh, the people they brought in initially, D.J. Grimman and others, uh, proposed things that the Republicans even went, what, what are you talking about? Uh, we're going to do asset recycling, we're going to privatize all the infrastructure and somehow magically, uh, you know, we're going to put more burden on the states. Uh, it just, so that was it the just poison pill fly. that killed yeah, it? Oh, yeah. Oh. Well, yeah I mean, it was ridiculous. So uh, that's, uh, that's changed. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think uh, the president really wants to do an infrastructure package. Uh, and, he's, and I need his help uh, because uh, we're going to have to do some revenues. And we're going to need him to show people that it's okay uh, to do a little bit of revenues. I have my proposal, Penny for Progress. Uh, oh, which explain is, that. What is, what is Penny for well, Progress? Well, it's a de minimis approach that I thought, you know, even the most weak-kneed member of Congress or the Senate could support. because You're they're talking all, a gas tax? Yeah, well, they're scared of a gas tax, okay. and Obama would never go there. So uh, this just indexes the existing gas and diesel taxes. I won't go into the complexity of it. But we can then project that income, and we can bond. And we've figured out that we could bond to the point of filling in the hole in the trust fund and adding $17 billion a year uh, for new capacity, for resilience, uh, for state of good repair, and all the things we need to be dealing with. So uh, I think that's a, a pretty de minimis solution. It's up to ways and means, but uh, I'm going to uh, refine my proposal, introduce it, and give it to them, and hopefully they'll like it, and I'm going to propose it to the White House. Because I don't know if everyone in the room knows the history of the gas tax. I mean, it hasn't been raised since 1993, 25 years, right. at least on the national level, but states have been doing it, sure. correct? Uh, over 30 states have now done it. There have been no detrimental political consequences. In fact, a minority leader or incoming minority leader, Kevin McCarthy, thought it was a brilliant strategy to keep the California seats uh, and turn out Republicans is repeal the gas tax increase in California. He got his head handed to him. Uh, the new governor of Minnesota, Tim Waltz, my colleague, he ran on a 10 cent gas tax increase and the governor of, uh, elect of Michigan next door, Democrat, said, fix the damn roads. So people get it. They're tired of being stuck in congestion. They're tired of blowing out tires in potholes. Uh, and, the, and the commercial folks who we were just hearing from, uh, they know that the costs in terms of uh, you know, delayed deliveries and uh, more wear and tear on their vehicles. Uh, we wasted 3.1 billion gallons of fuel. You want to talk about climate change? We're wasting 3.1 billion a year with people stuck in traffic, wasting time, wasting fuel. Uh, people want solutions. So we're, we're already paying a price, you're saying? Oh, <laughs> huge. I mean, uh, T Texas Transportation Institute says that about $140 billion a year lost productivity, wasted fuel, and wear and tear. So you said tax hikes, but do we need, will you have to combine it with other things? Will there have to be budget cuts? Will there have to be borrowing? No, we're, nope. well, there would be borrowing, okay. but every year we would calculate uh, the income from the prior year, because it, it's not exact, it's gonna depend upon uh, basically f fuel economy and construction cost inflation. Uh, but we would adjust the amount of bonds that are issued each year, uh, and we would show that they're going to be paid for. So we're not creating new unpaid for debt, unlike the tax cuts, uh, but uh, real, uh, real investment, real jobs, real boost to the economy with uh, no new unpaid for debt. So what would the package look like? You've already addressed how we're paying for it. What, what would be in it? Well, we've, you know, we've got to build in uh, resilience for climate change. Uh, there, are, there are new techniques for green infrastructure. Uh, we, uh, you know, we have to bring things up to a state of good repair. We're, we have $100 billion to bring up transit to a state of good repair, let alone give people new transit options. And my proposal would both deal with state of good repair and uh, would have more money for new options uh, for people, new partnerships with the states. Uh, this administration has been very, very, very slow. They've created a whole new massive bureaucracy to slow down uh, transit grants. Uh, they just finally, I said, well, it's going to be my first oversight hearing. And then last week, wow, lo and behold, they let out a few uh, transit grants. But we're way behind. Even the Republican appropriators have written to them saying, look, you know, we've, we've got the money. We've appropriated the money. Spend, spend the money. 
Uh, and the good thing about transit is we have the strongest Buy America requirements of any part of the federal government. So it's not just you know construction jobs, it's engineering, it's design, it's high tech, it's manufacturing. I mean, it's all those things will get a boost. You mentioned making our infrastructure more resilient. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on the warnings in the national climate assessment that just came out? Well. Regarding infrastructure in uh, particular. Yeah, well, on my side of the aisle, we think uh, this is a real problem, unlike some on the other side of the aisle. And, uh, you know, there's been some controversy over how we deal with it. We are going to deal with it seriously. Uh, and we can do it through existing committees or we can have a select committee. Any of those things will work, but we're going to address it. In an infrastructure, um, you know, we've got to look at designs that are both more uh, acceptable at the beginning, but also are going to be resilient uh, to, you know, either inundation or earthquake. I mean, that's a big concern in my part of the country. Uh, we're rebuilding and building uh, things to withstand a very significant earthquake, the Cascadia. Uh, so we've got to anticipate these things, wildfires. Uh, you know, there's a whole host of things with climate change that we have to deal with in terms of both transportation infrastructure and other forms of infrastructure, buildings, et cetera. You know, speaking of disasters, our infrastructure has, has taken a pretty hard hit this year from whether it's hurricanes or the recent earthquake mm -hmm. that you're mentioning um, in, in Alaska and the Cascadia area, um, wildfires, and, and then we have the situation with the, uh, the campfire in the Paradise area where they think infrastructure, PG&E infrastructure may have actually caused that. What, if anything, can Congress do to help make sure that we do have safer, more modern infrastructure? Well, actually, when we uh, uh, passed uh, legislation reauthorizing uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency uh, last year, we put a new mandate on them to not, you know, previously they'd say, oh, well, oh, you've had that damage. Okay, here's your money to put it back the way it was. Just the way it was. Bad Even if it idea. was built in 1950, right, right, find the right, guy who designed right, it and, and put it back. Right, exactly. Makes and no so, sense. no, we said, no, uh, take these other things into account and build it so it will withstand the next uh, catastrophe. I was down in, in Puerto Rico uh, with a number of members and, uh, you know, I mean, their infrastructure obviously was a disaster. It wasn't very good before the hurricane. Uh, and again, the argument over, well, well, we'll rebuild a, you know, a grid that's going to fail again, or are we going to build a grid that can withstand this? I mean, but that hurricane was so phenomenal, and, and they are going to be that way in the future because of climate change, that, I mean, the wind farms were wiped out, the solar farms were wiped out, even the things that, that were they supposedly were right. for the future, uh, you know, to help deal with climate change, those have to be built in a different way, too. So what are your thoughts on public-private partnerships and how important those are going to be as we move forward in, in renewing and improving our infrastructure? Well, there are certain projects that lend themselves to P3, projects that can uh, you know, create revenue. Uh, they are generally limited to, I mean, we, we held uh, actually a bipartisan panel uh, met for uh, six months. Uh, and a few years ago on Transportation Infrastructure Committee, we tend to be less partisan than other committees. At the beginning, the Republicans were, oh, P3 is a solution. At the end, they went, oh, okay, a little bit. And basically, the conclusion was maybe 10 to 12 percent of our infrastructure needs can be met through P3s. Uh, the other 88 or 90 percent uh, is going to have to have real investment by the states, uh, local jurisdictions, uh, and the federal government. So. Uh, P3s are a tool in the toolbox, and uh, it's one that you know we want to use. Uh, where, and as I was mentioning to you beforehand, that you're talking about your commute, the Baltimore uh, Washington Parkway. Most people don't realize the Baltimore Washington Parkway is the responsibility of the United States uh, Park, Park Service. Service, and the Park Service, which has celebrated its centennial, has about seven or eight billion dollars in unmet needs and the things that people think of as parks. Uh, and so, you know, my idea with that. To me, it looks like, I mean, the governor of Maryland wants it for free. No, let's turn that into a P3. Let's bring it up to a state of good repair and use the revenue that comes in every year to do work in the parks. So there are creative ways, I think, to approach P3s that, that people will support. Your own state of Oregon is trying something creative. Uh, that it is a little controversial. What about the mileage tax? How would that factor in, if at all? Well, uh, vehicle miles traveled. Uh, we are on our third pilot now. And this one has multiple options to see if it's more socially acceptable to people. Uh, there are some people, despite carrying an iPhone, who don't know that they are located every second of every day. Uh, and they don't want the government to know where they are. And the, and the only fair way to do a VMT is 
if you're going to do VMT with uh, individuals, would be uh, with congestion pricing. Because, you know, you shouldn't charge a farmer uh, who has to drive 20 miles to the feed store the same per mile fee as someone who jumps on 205 in Portland and causes a backup. Uh, so we're not quite ready to go there yet. Uh, you know, I mean, as I say to people, people say, oh, well, I said, yeah, the people in Blumenauer's district, they're happy to have the government know where they are. The people in the rural parts of my district, it's like, you know, after you get the gun out of my cold hand, <laughs> then you can track my vehicle. So uh, not so much. So it's, 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 it's a future. We're, we're going to go there ultimately, especially as we have more penetration of vehicles that don't use uh, gas or diesel. Uh, but we don't need to go there yet uh, because that's a very small percentage of vehicles. And, uh, you know, we will, we will convert to that at some point in the future. But I'm going to propose that we have a national VMT pilot, uh, allow people to opt in. And uh, then you would get a rebate for, because we'll know how many miles you traveled and what kind of vehicle you have for the estimated uh, gas tax you would have paid. So. If you don't get a package through, in 2019, we know in 2020, campaign year hits. Does that mean no go? Does that stall everything? Probably. I mean, most things grind to a halt in presidential years. I would hope that we can get this done this year. Uh, and that's, like I say, our goal in the House is to have a, have a bill done, you know, within six months and get it over to the Senate. And hopefully the Senate can act a little more expeditiously than usual. Uh, we'll see. I mean, we just signed the Coast Guard bill at the White House yesterday. We sent it to the Senate mm, 18 months ago, I think. <laughs> so Democrats are willing to do a deal on infrastructure with the president, even if it gives him a victory to campaign on. Look, we've got plenty of other places to campaign against the president. Uh, infrastructure... <laughs> You know, infrastructure is to the benefit of all the people in the United States of America, Democrat, Republican, independent. And, uh, you know, it's just one, we don't need that. Uh, you know, we can deliver on that. He can't take, uh, he can take some credit, but he sure as heck can't take total credit because they controlled everything and they did nothing. In fact, they proposed to cut infrastructure investment. So before we go to the audience for questions, I would love to know just what is your number one infrastructure priority? Right now, if you had a magic wand, all the resources uh, that you, you needed, what would you fix first? Well, we need the resources. I, I did get a provision in the FAST Act, the last bill, that says any new money allocated will go through existing uh, programs, and that's where we'll go in the short term with a few a few tweaks because there are a few meaning things. Meaning what existing? Well, program? I mean... Uh, well, we have, you know, we, when we do long-term bills, we fight over the split between highways and transit, and, you know, you know we, we fight over other policy issues. Uh, we wouldn't need to fight over policy issues to do a short-term large injection that would get us through, uh, you know, October 1st, 2020, when we have to have a long-term bill. Basically, uh, you know, so we would have like a short-term bill, which has more funding, has a few tweaks to policy, and then the longer-term bill, uh, which will be a, a little more directed in terms of policy and approaching, uh, you know, smart infrastructure uh, that can move traffic. I mean, you know, how many times you sit at a traffic light and there's no one coming? Uh, couldn't you have crowdsourcing and, <laughs> and traffic lights are like change when there's no one on the other road? Uh, in fact, there, there's, a, yeah, there's a, a, a pilot project. Uh, I think there's one in Nevada and one going in Virginia. So uh, we, there's ways we could do with the make the existing infrastructure carry people better while we invest in the new infrastructure. So a multi-step project. Yep. Excellent. Well, let's go to questions. And if you would, again, identify yourselves. And gentlemen right here. You're in the front. more with pedestrians.org. Uh, what provisions do you see in the 2020 bill for walking, bicycling, in those modes? Well, uh, as you might remember, in the last bill, the FAST Act, uh, they, the Republicans did not want to continue the previous programs. You know, we had safe routes to school, and we had other dedicated funds that went into alternate modes. And, uh, but we managed to actually uh, preserve all of those uh, and by renaming them and putting them in other places in the bill. I would like to go back to a more honest approach uh, and a more directed approach to the states because we did leave states the option to not uh, do those sorts of alternate modes. Uh, that's what the one compromise uh, we had to do. Now, my state is still fully investing, as are most, but there's a few who are like, nah, nah, we're just going to put the money over here in in highways or whatever else. So we've got to go back to something more directed. All right, more questions? 
and I love safe routes to school. I mean, we got an obesity problem with kids. Uh, you know, I mean, everything that, that we were doing, that was a great program. I rode some of those routes with kids in, in Oregon, and it was a great program. I want to bring that back. Did we have a question over here? Okay. Thank you. Hey, good morning, Congressman Eugene with Transport Topics. Um, thank you for being here. And could you talk a little bit about more about the funding? And I know there's been some talk about earmarks. Could you um, just address the issue of earmarks in the upcoming Congress, if that's going to be in play? Uh, got rid of those, didn't you? Uh, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> the Republicans did. Uh, I actually proposed a, a reform uh, of earmarks. I wrote a surface transportation bill, which Obama killed, uh, and uh, I had reformed the earmark process. Uh, which would be its congressionally di directed investment. Now, do we think that all of the wisdom on how to uh, better serve the people of your district or your state, if you're a senator, comes from DOT in DC or your state DOT? No. Uh, so if we have a totally transparent process with people who are more accountable than the Secretary of Transportation or more accountable than the bureaucrats who run your state agency, you might get some projects done that they're ignoring. Uh, so I think congressionally directed spending in a fully transparent way. The way I reformed it was, A, you had to submit your projects online transparently with your name attached, and the worst projects generally are stuck in by the Senate and don't have names attached. Uh, secondly, uh, you had to show that uh, you had local support, you had letters of support. Third, it had to be consistent with, but not funded by, the state transportation improvement plan. And fourth, you had to sign uh, an affidavit that you have absolutely no fiduciary interest in that project. I had from uh, more than, I think it was somewhere over 415 members of Congress submitted projects. They submitted projects 10 times greater than what we were going to fund. So-called earmarks were always a small portion of directed spending. Technically, an earmark is something the appropriators do that isn't authorized. That's what a re an earmark is. But the Republicans broadly banned everything to a point where sometimes we had to do things that are ridiculous. I've got some unique federal lands in my district, BLM lands that are forested lands. And I, we needed to make some changes that the Republican, Greg Wald, and I agreed on. And they said, oh, no, because that's just in one state. You can't do that. Well, how stupid is that? So the, it was a rule adopted by the Republican conference that was nonsensical and, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't think we need that rule. All right, any further questions here? One here in the middle. Hey, Greg Lauer with Arnold Reporter. Chairman Barrasso proposed a package to, uh, to improve finances for the Highway Trust Fund that included a direct hit on electrification programs in this country to raise revenue. Your proposal seems a little bit different. What would you do differently as chairman to help electrify the transportation economy? Well, um, you know, electrification, I mean, obviously right now we're, you know, we, we, we've got to deal with uh, charging stations uh, and availability of charging stations to, you know, continue to get people to, uh, you know, purchase electric uh, vehicles. You know, Tesla has now got uh, an electric truck, which is going to be phenomenal, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, so we haven't, we actually in my region of the country, we had investment done by a federal agency, uh, the Bonneville Power Administration. They actually paid for some of the initial electrification. Uh, and it also goes to uh, electrification by incentivizing uh, truck stops uh, to put in uh, facilities so people don't have to idle their diesels at night and they can run their internal heaters and those sorts of things. Uh, you know, there's a, they're talking about solar panels on trucks. I mean, there's a whole host of things that can be done in the transportation modes that will help facilitate electrification. I mean, the, the grid is not the responsibility of, of my committee. That's Energy and Commerce, so I don't have any... Uh, grand thoughts on how, I mean, I, Obama talked a lot about the smart grid. I'm not quite sure how smart it is or what we did to move in that direction. There was supposedly some investment. I don't know what it did. All right, we have time for maybe one more question. All right, over here. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, my name is Miriam Gusevich. I'm just wondering, are you making any plans with regards to the whole idea of the infrastructure bank? This is something that we have been talking about for 30 years or more. Well, um, 
there are those who advocate that as a solution. It's just another tool, and probably from my perspective, in terms of transportation, a very minor tool. Uh, it makes more sense for water infrastructure, uh, electricity grid, things that uh, create revenue. Uh, but for most transportation, or particularly for transit, uh, I'm not aware of any railway uh, in the world, uh, you know, passenger railroad that makes money. Uh, there are some that say they, that, that they make money because, like in the UK, the government maintains the rails and owns the rails and Virgin runs over it. Yeah, they can make money, but if you have to maintain the rails or get the right of way, you're not going to be making money. So. It, it, it's not really applicable. Uh, it could be a, an additional tool, but we've got the TIFIA program and we've got public activity bonds already. Uh, and TIFIA has been very successful. It actually makes money uh, for the taxpayer, uh, has had virtually very few uh, failed projects. So it's not a high priority for surface transportation. I think it's a much higher priority for other forms of infrastructure. Congressman, thank you so much for your uh, many insights, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Great. Everyone.